Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have all nine Enneagram types of INFJs. Woot! And I'll have everyone introduce themselves. And so Anna, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Yes, my name is Anna Real. I have a personal growth blog at therealanna.com. Uh, it's spelled R-E-E-L, like my last name. Uh, I help people learn more about who they are and how to apply that knowledge uh, for personal growth and helping them reach their goals. And I just start coaching. Excellent. And Karen? Yes, my name is Karen and um, I don't have anything to plug, but I'm Enneagram 2 with the one wing and I type my instinctual stack as social, sexual, self press. Very cool. And Jesse? I'm Jesse Miller. I'm the co-founder of Typecast Hero, and that is a channel specifically focused on Carl Jung psychology, MBTI, and it promotes my research project, which involves thousands of people from all over the world, 82 countries. Yeah, very rad, Jesse. And Matt? Hey, I am uh, Matt Hall. Um, I'm Enneagram 4 with a wing 5, and I am a um, software developer and uh, also a writer. And I've got a book coming out probably early next year um, about my journey as a father through childhood cancer. Very inspiring. And Tori? Hi, so I'm Tori. Uh, I have a YouTube channel on, you know, typology, and I mainly do like MBTI as well as sometimes um, an anagram, and it's called Tori H. Um, and I'm a five wing four with the social sexual variants, even though my social and sexual are pretty close and my five and four are also pretty close. So, um, sometimes I test either way. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, my name is Joyce and I'm a certified MBTI practitioner and I facilitate the instrument in organizations and I'm also a coach. That's a little bit about me. And Emily? Hi, I don't have anything to plug, but I'm Emily and I'm a seven wing six social sexual and I've been studying MTI and Enneagram for like four or five years. That's really cool. And Keelan? Name's Keelan, um, Enneagram eight wing nine, a papa bear if you've ever seen one, teacher and um, follow uh, Jesse on Typecast Heroes, it's great. Mm -hmm. I'm Lizzie. I'm a nine wing one and I don't have anything to plug. Lizzie is an amazing singer, uh, but I'm, I don't want to single out her nineness. So, <laughs> but uh, I thought Thank I'd you. plug her. <laughs> yes. And so, yeah, check out all of the YouTubers on this panel and these Twitter peeps. They're really cool. Anna Real and Jesse have YouTube channels called Anna Real <laughs> and also Typecast Heroes. So, and Tori also has a YouTube channel as well called Tori H. And the rest of you guys have really cool Twitter accounts. And Keelan is just Jesse's friend, but he's a really cool friend and awesome friend. <laughs> and so, my first question for you all is what is the vice and virtue of your type? And we'll start with Anna. So I'm an Enneagram one and our vice is anger and our virtue is serenity, which I definitely need some more of. Very informative. And Karen? Um, so for Enneagram two, the vice is pride and the virtue is humility. That's really interesting. <laughs> and Jesse? Okay, so um, vice would be workaholic, but virtue is we get things accomplished. It's very um, mm -hmm. goal oriented. Yeah, the Enneagram three virtue is honesty, and the vice is deceit, right? Self deceit. Yeah. Yeah, self deceit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And Matt. Yeah. So our um, uh, Enneagram four, the vice is envy. And the virtue is equanimity or equanimity. Yeah. Very interesting. And, and Tori. <laughs> so um, Enneagram 5, uh, the vice is avarice and the virtue is knowledge. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I'm an Enneagram 6. My virtue is faith and my vice is fear. And Emily? 
Uh, for Enneagram sevens, the vice is gluttony and the virtue is joy. Mm -hmm. And Keelan? The vice is lust and the virtue is uh, generosity, magnanimity. And Lizzie? So I think for nines, the vice is sloth or is it narcotization? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's sloth awkward. because my, my ESFP wife is a nine and we were looking at that earlier. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, the vice is sloth and the virtue is peace, I think. Yeah. yeah. Really cool summaries, you all. <laughs> and so I guess we'll start going in depth with. Anna, sorry, like you're first, and so we it's it's really special. We get to start with you, and so let's go a little bit in depth with your Enneagram One quirks. What distinguishes you as a one, as an INFJ? And <laughs> I overanalyze everything, like this question of how do I answer this perfectly. <laughs> it's like, wait, what is the question? So I make sure I answer it right. <laughs> That is so true. <laughs> yeah, so perfection like is a huge thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I I actually relate to that. <laughs> like I feel like everything has to match like this perfect vision of how to do things. But a one might be in a, my tri type, so that could be why or it could be an INFJ thing too. I <laughs> Cool. Um, and so any other quirks, Anna? Or perfectionists two? go first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to hear what everyone else's answers are first. <laughs> Make sure I'm doing it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what we love about you, Anna. When you do things, oh. you do it perfect. We can always help <laughs> <talk to> you. <laughs> yeah, you and your integrity. <laughs> Yeah, I, I constantly wrestle with feeling not good enough. And I think my INFJ-ness kind of flavors my Enneagram oneness in, like I think a lot of Enneagram one descriptions sound very TJ-like to me, yeah. um, or maybe even SJ, but being an FJ type, I even bring in that ideal into all of my relationships. Like I wanna be a good friend. And like, especially the closer a friend is to me, I just, I wanna learn everything about them so I can be the best friend to them. Like I make them take the love languages quiz and try to figure out their personality. So it's like, how can I best love you? And <laughs> so yeah, the, the FJ is just, I also bring that into how I handle my relationships. And that's where I can sometimes come across a bit like a two. Sometimes I don't know if it's me leaning into that two wing or if it's just because I'm an INFJ trying to do relationships right. And so for me, it's like, well, what does it mean to be a good friend? And so that's where I can kind of look like a two at times, I think. Yeah, it's like you want to approach your relationships right and you want to do right in your relationships. Does it ever cause tension in your body when you always try to like m do everything properly? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of tension there. Um, yeah, a lot of guilt. I am a self-preservation one, so I'm mainly more critical towards myself. Uh, my inner critic is very, very loud. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So INFJs, do you relate to the inner critic, like, in general? <laughs> oh, my gosh, yes. Yeah. Um, I also relate. Really? Yeah, I relate to that a lot, too, especially, like, the getting to everyone I care about to, like, take every personality test ever and, like, reading their astrology charts and things like that, just knowing everything about them. But I think it's, especially since I, like, disintegrate to one, I can get, like, even more perfectionistic about it. So, but it's not, like, as, maybe not as pervasive as an issue for me as it would be for, like, a one core. But I definitely feel that, yeah. Well, I, uh, Joyce, I, I really relate, uh, I, but I also have one in my tri-type, so, um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if, I'm sure that factors in, but I, I'm interested in to, to know if um, any of the INFJs who don't have one in their tri-type relate to, to what Anna was talking about. No, I definitely relate hardcore to that inner critic. Um, for me, the way that, because I'm a three, I go about 
fixing it probably different than you do. Like our, our ways of trying to like quiet that inner critic are probably very different, but I definitely hear it very strongly constantly. So I relate. I also relate to the inner critic. Like um, when I, when I'm in conversations, like um, I want to say things in the most tactful way <laughs> as possible. Like I don't want any unnecessary conflict or unnecessary suffering caused by me. Um, and so I'm really hard on myself sometimes, but I'm also kind of, I can be hard on other people too. You know, it goes both ways. <laughs> so any other NFJs want to chime in on this topic? Um, my brain talks a lot of shit to me, but it's mainly if I feel like I didn't do what I was doing the best way possible. It's like, did I get all of my points across? No. All right. You're shitty. But I'm a lot better about it nowadays, though. I think that was kind of a depression thing also. Hmm. I'm wondering, Lizzie, what are your thoughts on this as a nine wing one? <laughs> um, I definitely have an inner critic. And I relate to being, I don't know, I don't remember who said they're hard on other people too. I'm kind of like that, like with my younger brother, especially. I think because he's like in my my inner circle of the people I'm okay to be critical to, you know? And so my nine kind of steps back and my one wing takes over. Um, so I definitely relate to that. This is a fascinating discussion. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm wondering, a, another trait of ones is that they have tension all over their body, especially around the neck area and the shoulder area. And so I'm wondering, do you guys have tension there? I know Anna talked about it. I have it too. So yeah, this is fascinating. <laughs> I have like that, I've had like chronic tension and pain in like my neck and my shoulders, like literally for as long as I could remember, I could like, I think I, I told my mom about it like as early as like second grade. And she's like, you're too young to be having neck problems, but it's, that's where I carry all my stress and it like never goes away. But. <laughs> Yeah, I relate. I hard relate to that, Emily. <laughs> yeah, and m massages are too expensive, so it's like, you know, it's hard to get rid of it. Uh, mine's always sore, but it looks good. Like the traps look good, so I don't really care. <laughs> that was the best comment ever. <laughs> I just have to say that my seven like appreciates that positive reframing. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder if it's because Keyline Key, Keylan is has a nine wing too, and nines are known for being funny. Because Elizabeth's Twitter is so funny. <laughs> yeah, that, that was hilarious. I I don't know if I can like super speak on it because I'm an athlete. So like I I run all the time. Like I ran like twenty something miles this weekend. So like I don't I I feel pain like all over. So it's not really confined to an area but I don't I don't know I feel like that's probably because of like my lifestyle choices probably to go back on the being harsh on yourself thing after I just said that my brain said nobody need to hear that you douche calm down <laughs> yeah <I> introverts <laughs> introverts are known for being a little harder on themselves because they internalize things way more and they keep it in their inner world more so it's easier to be harsh on yourself yeah, but anyone can be harsh on themselves. Just that's another way. And so any other traits, Anna, you'd like to talk about that are one? <laughs> like, cause I, so then we can generate discussion. It's okay if everyone relates. I mean, that's still information. That's still really cool. There was a time I was feeling really one during this panel. So basically <laughs> my, my parents are washing dishes in the background and they're, they were also fighting too. And I'm like, I told you I was recording and now you're fighting. And then now I was being hard on them. Um, so that's that's my one for, for today. <laughs> and so Anna, any other traits that you uh, identify as one that you relate to? So this might be too, like an INFJ one specific thing, but I was curious to hear, like we started off um, pre this session, we were talking about the whole like NIFE versus leaning more on NITI. And so I was just curious, everybody else's experience with that. Um, Susan Storm's post was actually one that I read about the INFJ one, and it was talking about how we can be a bit more analytical, um, just the nature of being a one and being a perfectionist and 
um, just always constantly thinking about how we can improve on things. Uh, and so I feel like that naturally has caused me to develop my TI more. Um, you know, being a tertiary function, it's also like a big insecurity. And so being an Enneagram one, I think that amplifies that insecurity. So then I try to make up for it. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I guess I'm curious everybody else's experience with that. I relate to being analytical. Like I have that side to me. Like I can, I can come off as, as warm. That's the feedback I get from other people when they describe me. But like inside when I'm mulling over something in my head, it can feel like kind of detached and analytical and it's surprising, but it's there. <laughs> yeah. How about everyone else? So for me, I think anagram type and our MBTI is closely kind of influencing each other so for example i have i mean anagram five wing four and five is really something that um like responds really well to my ti so i i do find that my ti is very strong actually uh, when it comes to like intellectual stuff like um you know when analyzing social political issues when analyzing like i i can do debates pretty well um, I used to be on a debate team in school. So I feel like I can really detach um, from my FE when I'm analyzing something. But in real life, like in actual, you know, daily interaction with people, my FE is like way more obvious. Um, but the TI is more like what I use when it's like ideas oriented. So that's also like related to the NOM5 thing. Yeah. <laughs> people have told me like when people come in the room, like my, my face turns on, like, <laughs> like it's like FE cannot turn off when people are there. So it then like turns on. Yeah. And so I guess Tori, because you're leaving soon, we'll, we'll start um, with you and then we'll continue back in, in the chronological order <laughs> to, to make sure it, like, yeah, you, you get your side. And, and so Tori, what are your INFJ five quirks? Um, so I would say like definitely analytical as well, but um, in a different, maybe in a different way from uh, Anagram 1. So Anagram 5 is very preoccupied with knowledge and also I would say like um, ideas in general. Um, that is more like, because I, I am always interested in um, things like political science, international relations, um, and I can get really into uh, such topics. And that's why I actually tested, wrongly tested as INTJ in the past um, because of this confusion. And that's another thing, like people often confuse MBTI with anagram because there are so many stereotypes. They're like, oh, you can only be a certain type of INFJ or you can only be a certain type of anagram five. But really for me, it's like my INFJ um, cognitive functions I can like have an anti appearance because of the anagram five traits. Um, because when I really go into discussions, I can very easily detach from FE. Um, but only when it's in the boundaries of like, you know, having an intellectual discussion. So when it comes to like my relationship with people, I'm still like pretty much an INFJ, um, like, you know, and all that. So. It can get like confusing. People can like easily uh, mistype me. Like also another random incident is that ran one random guy online keeps saying that I appear like an anagram nine, and he thinks that I'm lying about being a five point four, um, because of the FE, you know, because our FE is so strong when we are like doing our channels, especially like we want to include people, we want to have harmony, and you know when I talk to guests on my channel I'm very friendly and so people assume I'm like a two or a nine but it doesn't mean that every single INFJ is automatically a nine or a two because of their friendliness and um, it's an FE trait so yeah. Tori I relate to that I've had people accuse me of being a nine and a two surprisingly uh, before I have no idea how they reached there but um a common mistype in tests, like INFJs sometimes score INTJ on, on tests. That happens, like 16 personalities or something that, like I've seen a few INFJs have that happen. And so that's pretty common. Tori, if you have more to say on your Enneagram 5 INFJ quirks, any more quirks, and then we can 
generate a round circle discussion? I think other quirks are, because the thing is my five and four are both pretty strong, I would say. So um, I would say it's like a mix of quirks. And I think there's this theory that apparently you, both of your anagram types are like your anagram types. Like there's no wing. I mean, I don't know about that theory, but um, for me, that's my experience. Like both of them are um, pretty strong influence on me. And so I think, but then I'm also a social variant. So that's like confuses people again, because they, they assume that five and four means you have to be always like, introverted and like not never talking to people <laughs> always like in the knowledge zone or in the like intense emotions um again i think for me um what i relate to is more of um the like the core value of my anagram type so for example for anagram five my core one of my core value is really understanding um how things work and and how you know like it's more like a broader, I, I guess it also is related to NI, so um, NTI, so NITI loop, you know. Um, so it's really about like gathering knowledge on the world and, and why certain things happen in the world. And, and that's why I'm really interested in like psychology, philosophy and um, politics also. But it's more like a general like interest in these areas, which... I know like not every, I mean, some INFJs are really into that, but I also know some other INFJs who are more into psychology and more into like the counseling aspect of INFJ. And while I'm also interested in psychology and all that, I would say that um, if you look at the things that I post, for example, on Facebook, and um, I, I think I'm better um, at analyzing the, the other aspects. They are more like, typical of five like I post a lot about this like integrated um like commentary like commentary on you know um it could be like social political it could also be like other areas so I noticed that it actually is different from other INFJs I know who may not have a five um in their anagram type that they don't post as much about this um these topics, I guess, like they may be, for example, in Aram 2 might be posting something that is more like um, warm and supportive as their, their main, I don't know, this is like my guess. But um, yeah, I think it's just the focus of my attention. It's not on those. Um, I mean, I, I still care about supporting people in real life. But it's just that when I'm online, or when I'm writing, um, my my core interest happens to be in like understanding people and society and kind of integrating those um, ways of like understanding, I guess. Yeah, that's super fascinating. And so INFJ thoughts, you all, after hearing that, do you relate, not relate? I relate to the people typing me also. Um, I get typed a lot as, actually, I hear a lot of people say ISTP or ENTP more than INTJ on my channel when they watch me because my TI comes out pretty strongly. Um, but I definitely understand relating more to the thinker than the feeler side. And then I think, Joyce, you said when somebody walks into the room, you said your face changes, right? Because it's like Effie is like, let's go. It's ready. It's time to like to engage in this moment. And I relate to that as well, where it's like, it's almost sometimes I get resentful when somebody walks into the room because I'm wanting to do whatever I'm doing, like focusing on my work. And when somebody comes in, it's like Effie takes over and I can't, I have to like stop the thoughts. It's no more introspection, no more deep thinking. It's like, nope, we're going to go take care of this person now. And I can get really mad really quickly. It's a frustrating. <laughs> I relate to that. Yeah, I, I relate to that, too. And I also relate to what Tori said about um, really needing to know uh, why and how things work um, instead of just kind of accepting things at face value, really digging into the information and getting into that TI loop, sort of the NITI loop. How about Karen? I relate to that as well, obviously, with the NITI. I find that I probably have a much more narrow focus perhaps than you do Tori because I tend to focus on particular people to try to figure them out 
And then, um, and then I try to figure out the dynamics between people or a, dyna- a social dynamic in a group and try to understand that. So I find that most of my, um, my puzzling that I'm doing to understand things is related to people. Yeah. I find a lot of my puzzling relating to people too. Yeah. yeah. But you're um, way warmer than me, Karen. <laughs> You you are like so you you feel like pure fe unleashed like your voice is so warm and it makes people feel welcomed and loved on the spot. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> and Emily, um, so I like I relate to what you said about like needing to know like the mechanics behind like everything and how everything works. Like for example, if someone like presents like is trying to argue something with me and they're presenting like a statistic like my I might not say anything but my mind will immediately go to like how like all the possible ways that they could have messed up like collecting the data in that statistic but like I'm going to want to know how like the one thing led to another rather than just like the evidence itself like the evidence is like important to me, but I also, I need to know everything that's going on behind that. And so I, maybe that's just my bad tea, but yeah, I relate to that a lot. And Keelan? For the nine in me uses um, FE more like, um, well, the NI FE with the nine is like, it's who should I be protecting right now? Or, um, how to maintain peace with this person. But the eight is more like who's being a turd and who should I be avoiding right now? (laughs) I don't know if I answered the question. I honestly forgot the question. I mean, that's a cool answer to whatever question was there. (laughs) And Lizzie? Yes, I caught myself relating too much. And I was like, oh, I'm being such a nine right now. But um, I think I relate a lot to fives in general because like I have a five in my tri-type and I love fives. Um, So I did relate and a lot of people tell me that I'm too analytical and I need to like stop thinking so much. Um, But I really like can't avoid my thought process to, I have to be able to analyze something because that's how I get like the understanding to be able to understand other things much simpler. And so it drives a lot of people crazy, I think. Um, but it's my process, so I can't really avoid it, I think. Oh, and I totally relate to what Jesse said about feeling kind of, like, annoyed when people come into a room, and I have to all of a sudden, like, turn on my extroverted feeling, and I'm like, why would you do this to me? I wanted to be focused on something right now. I I really related to that, too. Once, like, I was hanging out with my INFP friend, and, like, he came in the room, and he was like, you know, Joyce, when you see me, you put on an F.E. face, and I was like, he's like, no, you 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 can be FI real with me. Just like, just be real. And he was like, you don't have to like put on this FE mask. And I was like, I didn't even know I was putting on an FE mask. <laughs> it's like so automatic that I can't really like tell. But it is annoying like when you're deep into doing something, but then someone comes in the room and then you can't turn off the FE and you're like, I can't analyze things as well in this state. <laughs> oh yeah, I got you. Well, when Jesse said that, th- that's when I realized my the tension in my body comes in usually when someone walks in the room um, because all of a sudden it is that pressure to perform, I suppose, that I feel. Do all of you feel that or is this, is this more of an image center type? Okay. <laughs> so I relate a lot to that. Like when people enter the room, I, my FE goes on automatically. But one thing I think that's like maybe different from what the rest of you have said so far is like, I think maybe like as a seven, since I'm not like, I, I leave my schedule like so open and I'm always like prepared to be interrupted by something. I don't know why I'm like that, but so I think I'm just always on that mode where I'm like ready for anyone to like interrupt me and come in and like be in FE mode for them. So it doesn't like frustrate me, but I think it used to a lot when I was younger, like before I realized I need to like be more flexible or something and that there are a lot of people in my house and they're going to come in and pop in at any moment. But yeah, I definitely can't like focus on anything else that's like in my mind when somebody else is around though, like all of my attention goes away to the person. 
It's like this people orientedness that comes in when people walk in and it can be disruptive to either like your goals as a type three for Jesse or just generally thinking it's hard to think when people are in the room because you're like, yay, good feelings, good vibes. <laughs> if it's somebody that I don't really care about, my face will stay the same. But if it's somebody that I love, like I turn into a mall Santa, I'm like, come on in, let's have it. Mm -hmm. For sure. <laughs> uh, oh, so um, just before I have to go soon, but um, I'm just going to mention that I think uh, INFJ, the qualities also affect the, the kind of the way that I approach my Enneagram 5. So, so even when I'm looking at politics, for example, I tend to like to analyze it from a psychology point of view. Like, I don't want to just analyze like, oh, like very technical stuff about politics, like, oh, two party system, what is the structure? I'm more like, understanding why people vote a certain way like what is the psychology and why do people behave a certain way um like why do people for example like to uh, group to group together to um uh i guess like towards a certain area like i just use psychology a lot and i i'm very interested at the end of the day about like people because that's infj um but i also want to understand how the system works so it's more like a my approach is more like a psychology approach into politics um, and I do notice that some INTJs do that too if they have like a more feeling anagram like they can kind of integrate that into the understanding so for example like if INTJ has an anagram 4 somewhere then they can kind of integrate that into the understanding um, of like the more technical subjects um, and also I think because of the very strong Enneagram 4 that I have. Um, that's another thing, like people often confuse Enneagram 4 with FI and um, people are very confused because they think that FE users cannot have like, like the intense emotions and, and care about authenticity, which is something that Enneagram 4s really do care about. Like we really care about individuality and that's like the number one trait that I look for uh, or at least one of the traits that I look for in people. And um, my experience is that the FE can sometimes be annoying to me because it kind of conflicts with my core value, if that makes sense. Because it's like, I want harmony, but at the same time, my core value is, I, I do want to be real with people and, um, and I do want to also um, be logical, but it's just, you know, it's, it's there, like it's very strong. So, uh, yeah. Kiersey, he says, he says the NF temperament generally cares about authenticity. So, but it's in different ways. So pretty much that's why like NFs get obsessed with like Brene Brown's work, like on vulnerability. NFs just like emotional realness um, because it's like important. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, yeah, thank you, Tori, for that. And so I was wondering, before before Tori leaves, um, maybe we can go over the defense mechanisms of each of the types, starting with Anna. <laughs> the, the defense mechanism for Enneagram 1, we use reaction formation to avoid anger and stay in control of our feelings and instincts in order to maintain a self-image of being right. So short answer there, there's reaction formation. Excellent. And Karen? I found twos use repression. That's the defense mechanism of personal, twos use repression of personal needs and feelings to avoid being needy and to maintain a self image of being helpful. Wow, that's profound. And Jesse? All right, so <laughs> vindication time. I'm gonna get it right this time. I looked it up. It's identification. We use identification. That's that's really cool. And Matt. Yeah, so we um, we actually use um, interjection. Interjection. It's a hard word to say. Um, so uh, we fully like say you have negative experience. We fully absorb those. We internalize them. Um, and then we sort of like incorporate them into our, I guess, our sense of self, um, kind of like that. So, yeah, interjection. And Tori? Um, so for Anagram 5, um, 
and I've got five users withdrawal. And what is interesting is that um, it's not always physical withdrawal. It can be like a more like a mental withdrawal from emotions and like compartmentalization. So kind of almost like denying or ignoring um, the certain like whatever is like affecting us. But then also, I, I guess four wing five and five wing sports are a bit like contradictory, but the four is also really intense. I mean, interjection is, I have experiences with that as well, um, especially younger, like just having that accidentally um, getting the experiences of um, you, your relationship with others as part of your identity. Like you kind of take on that, yeah. Yep. And I'm a six and my defense mechanism is projection. And what this is, is that like the six has fears and sometimes it projects it onto other people or the world. And, and so it's like confusing internal sense of fear for external sense of fear. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if I relate to that, <laughs> but yeah. So the seven defense mechanism is rationalization. So since the seven's deepest fear is like being trapped in pain or discomfort, they'll like, um, they'll like find a way to reframe any situation and turn it into a positive thing, even if it's like obviously terrible. So that way they don't have to like feel anger or like disappointment or frustration. And then they can just convince themselves like everything's fine instead of actually taking the steps to fix it. Uh, Enneagram eight, defense mechanisms, repression, displacement, denial. What's happening? Wait, what happened? And eh, that's not happening. I love how I can like hear the chillness in Keelan's voice and he's a wing nine and Elizabeth's voice is super chill too and she's a nine. <laughs> and Lizzie? Um... Nine's defense mechanism is narcotization, which is basically like to kind of zone out into something that's comfortable, like eating a lot of candy or being on your phone or things like that. But I don't want to say whether or not I do this, but <laughs> it's definitely a thing. That's, that's lovely, Lizzie. And so that was a beautiful a beautiful summarization of the defense mechanisms. And so we'll talk about Karen. So as a two, what are your two quirks as an INFJ? I see myself as like a maybe jack of a couple trades, but master of none. And I think that's because the, um, I mean, the, the INFJ, at least of in myself and then the, the INFJs that I know and have gotten to know, there is a lot of um, ability for internal depth. But I find that my type two continually pulls me out. So there, it's like there's a, a tension comes up between the internal world and the external world. And I, I find that I don't do either of those departments very well but I spend enough time in both of them to the, to where I can manage both pretty well. Um, I don't neglect my internal world uh, typically, and I don't typically neglect my relationships and, and external world, although my house, I neglect that. But um, I, I don't, I, I'm not um, specializing in one. And so other twos, especially ones that are more extroverted, they um, really specialize in people and relationships and uh, put a lot of their energy there. Um, INFJs, many of them are tend, that I know tend to be more uh, more introspective people than, than I am even, or just spend a lot of more time in their internal world than I do. And so what, what they bring forward is um, tends to be very rich. The, um, their, their thought process and, it, and their understanding can be very rich. So that's what I would say is, is just the um, ne not specializing in either one. That's really interesting, Karen. It's like the two kind of emphasizes your FE more and it can cause you to be like spread out in many directions, like in the direction of other people. It can be harder to focus on yourself and your own internal beliefs about things. And yeah. 
It can. Um, although I'll say on the flip side, I know with, at least in my reading that I've done, that type twos tend to be one of the types, the later types to come to grips with um, the, the less healthy parts of our personality structure. And um, I think that the type, the cognitive function stack of the INFJ helped me to wake up to that on the earlier side. And so I'm grateful for that. Uh, I I was able to, I, I'm still, I, I'm still waking up to all of those um, type two patterns, but I was in my early twenties when I started to notice um, that I was, I was my, I was going to uh, be helpful to people that it really my helpfulness was about me and it wasn't really about them. And um, it was about serving my own need. It wasn't really about giving. I, I should say it, at the core, it wasn't about giving. So, um, so that, that has helped at the same time. I've had a lot of people accuse FE users of that thing that you're, you're saying like that when you're taking care of somebody else, you're really taking care of yourself because you have to, you like really have to do it. But one of the things that I'm constantly fighting back against is you are still doing a lot of good by taking care of others, regardless of how it makes you feel. So I don't, I don't like that, that like, I don't know, that negative sway that some people have really tried to put on our FE because just from talking to you, I'm sure you do a whole lot of good for others, it sounds like. So I don't know. Don't beat yourself up over that kind of thing, I don't think. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think part of uh, these days, I, I would say I'm growing to be more healthy in, in my giving these days. Mm -hmm. And not that I didn't do a lot of good giving to people when... It, um, when I was younger and I wasn't realizing where that was coming from, that it was really my own need that was, I was trying to fill. It was my, my feeling that I, I was not enough on my own and I wasn't going to be wanted if I just showed up. I needed to give in order to be worthy. I, I wasn't aware at the time that I was really, it was out of my need. And I think that um, because I've been on the receiving end of of two neediness that is really about it's the giving that is really about filling themselves it, there can be a lot of damage that's done um even even when the giving seems good and, and when the two feels like they're coming from a good place if it really is a, a it's not about um giving from an, an altruistic place and I realize that there is, you can never be 100% altruistic, but um, the more, the more twos can wake up to how we do actually have needs. Cause that, that's what the repression is. The repression is repressing that we are needy too. We are not just givers, these bountiful givers that have all this love to give and don't need anything of, of our own, that we're honest with that with ourselves. And then we're, we're able to be honest and, and bring our needs into relationships in, in an obvious way instead of a um, like coming from through the back door to get our needs met. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that was beautifully articulated, Karen. The two is often compared to the giving tree, the the child, the children's story where the giving tree gives away its branches and like everything until it's a stump. And then it's kind of like the two can kind of feel like it's burdening someone by trying to get its needs met. So you always like meet other people's needs, which is like, you're really great at meeting needs, Karen. Like whenever I, I'm talking to you or in a video with you, I feel like instantly calmed by how good of a hostess you are <laughs> and just uh, like your warming presence. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope it, I, I, I do truly believe that it comes, it comes from a more honest place today, even though I do, I st still catch myself all the time. Like, oh, I know why I was doing that. There I go again, like flattering or um, just giving attention in some way, be because I know that it's actually, I'm needing to, f to feel the reciprocation, the appreciation, that sort of thing. So, but I, I it is, it's, it's wonderful to see as time goes on that I am less um, attached to, to the response I get. And I can, I can just um, show up at, naturally and then um, have an open hand about whatever happens from there. So 
So I'm glad to hear that, Joyce. Thank you. <laughs> um, before I go, just wanted to comment on this. Um, yeah, I definitely, I mean, I'm not an Enneagram 2, but I do notice that um, my friends who are Enneagram 2, um, when they are at least in the earlier stages, when they're not as aware, um, it can they can really use the two for emotional validation, um, which is similar to how we use FE for emotional validation. Um, I mean, I had ex I, I guess I had similar experiences because of the FE problem. Um, like especially when I was a teenager, um, FE was really used for that. And I think just having the self awareness really helps because people can feel. I think people naturally can tell when you are being genuine with your compliments and being genuine with your um, help um, as opposed to you actually needing validation from them. So they, they tend to treat you very differently when you come from two different places. So what I tend to notice is that um, in the past when I was you know using FE in a more like needing validation way, people don't respect that. Um, and they, they actually have a lot of disrespect um, and I always wonder why, um, even though I was saying these nice things, but then, you know, once I'm aware of that, um, and, and you genuinely praise people when you do want to praise them, it's, and, and you do want to, uh, you know, you can bring a difference, it, the feedback's different too, so. Yeah, yeah so anyway, really panel, sorry, <laughs> got to go because I have to um, do some work and later on I have to head off to work, it's a time difference thing problem, yeah. Yeah, it was great talking, Tori. Uh, she has a great YouTube channel. Go check her out. It's Tori H. And she has social and political commentary as a type five. If you like that, you'll like her channel. And so I'll see you around, Tori. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Bye, Bye Tori. <laughs> You're on my channel next time. Bye-bye. For sure. Bye. <laughs> and so any thoughts on Karen's um, type two experience as an INFJ? Relate, don't relate? So, yeah, I think I have like as a like a similar ish experience as like a social seven. I think what happens with me is like, I, OK, I think my motive is more like self-interested. Um, like with my FI being unconscious and with FE, I think it's like legitimately easier for me to figure out what other people need and like what would make them happy than it is to figure out what would make me happy. And so. I feel like I have a habit of like trying to make myself happy vicariously like through other people like, like trying to be whatever I think the perfect person is for them or trying to meet all of their needs and then which like doesn't work because I'm not listening to myself but then sometimes I end up resenting the person and or like just getting burnt out and not knowing why but yeah I definitely have that that same FE problem which I need to get better at but yeah, it's it's kind of like meeting needs is 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 <laughs> is is really cool. I mean, sorry, my <laughs> my thinking function is not on today. <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm just calling everything cool and stuff. Um, yeah. And so, what is everyone's experience with meeting needs? How does it feel like as an as you meeting needs? Does it feel like a compulsion? Does it feel like um, not? It's a compulsion. I call it a compulsion on my channel. Like it feels like such a compulsion. And um, and I'm sure that this has happened to others, but like I've been told that like, I just want to be a martyr. Like that's what I want to be. Like this is like, I'm doing this so that I can seem like a certain thing, which is frustrating to me because I don't feel like I do that. But also as a three, like three have a tendency to be unconsciously manipulative, not even on purpose. But when we also have like all of our personas and INFJs in general seem to have personas, right? You guys put on different faces for the people that you're around. You kind of orient yourself towards them. And if somebody sees you in enough of those situations and they start to think that it's all, none of it's real. But I don't know, I could go on and on about what even is real or authentic. But to me, like, <laughs> I don't know, it's about the reception that I'm getting, but it would make sense because I'm a three. So as far as meeting people's needs go, I do the best that I can, but I do know I relate to what Karen was saying with people sometimes not, sometimes people believing that I'm doing it for, for bad reasons. And I understand the validation need hardcore, like that's too, too real. <laughs> I do not like that need for validation, but that's definitely an INFJ thing, I think.
the need for validation thing. Um, I have no problem getting somebody or like making them hate me. Like, I, I don't care about that. If it feels right, if it works out for everybody around me, then that's like, that's bigger than just not hurting that person's feelings. Like, suck I'm it up. kind of the same way. And I was going to say, um, I kind of do the same thing with needs, but from a different angle as a nine, like I don't know what my needs are unless I know what everyone else's needs are. And so um, this has been coming up a lot lately where people will be like, well, focus on what you need. And I'm like, how am I supposed to know that if I don't know what everyone else in the room needs or what everyone else in the situation needs? Because my needs are based off of theirs and, and intertwined. And if I don't know theirs, I don't know mine. I've had that before too, where it's like, I'm pretty adaptable. Like if you're good, then yeah, means I'm if you're good. good, I'm good. So I don't need to worry about my needs. <laughs> That's what I think anyway. But I'm the same way, Keelan, where if someone doesn't like me or if we disagree on something, like that's fine with me as long as everyone's fine. It's like, if it's fine, it's fine. And more than likely we, the people or the person who's getting offended, we don't like you anyway. So it doesn't really matter. What is your, what are your instinctual variants, by the way? I'm not sure what that means. Oh, okay. It's like the social, sexual, and self-preservation. It's okay if you don't know them, but I was wondering if that might be part of it because I'm social blind and sexual dominant. And so that kind of, I think, goes into it a little bit where it's like, if I don't like someone or they don't like me, it's like, I don't really care. As long as everyone's fine, it's fine. Then I would wager to say I'm probably around the same thing then. But it's been a while. Like, I've seen it a while ago and I just didn't dive into it because there was so much shit. Yes. It's fascinating if you get into it. It's so cool. But there is, there's so much that goes into it, so. I relate to you, Lizzie, when you said that, like, you don't know your own needs, but you know other people's needs. I'm more aware of other people's needs than my own needs. And so, Anna or Matt, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, so, I definitely relate to wanting to meet other people's needs. I think as the reformer, I sometimes, well, maybe you guys relate as NI Doms, but I sometimes take it further with like, trying to meet needs that they don't even know that they have <laughs> like here let me make you be the best person that you can be let me help you reach your full potential and <laughs> and then i have so yeah i also relate to having such a hard time asking for anything and um again like it's it might be my my two wing um or also just uh you know, like, I know that it's okay to ask for help. We should have mutually beneficial friendships and relationships. But I think I just get so afraid of crossing the line into being too needy or asking for too much. And then that's bad. That would make me a bad friend. And so I just, like, I just go too far back and just repress my own needs and focus on the other person's. Yeah, I relate to that, Anna. It's like... The reason why I'm unsure of my needs is I repress them when I see someone else's needs. So the moment when I see someone else in need uh, and, and it's conflicting maybe with like focusing on mine is conflicting with noticing theirs, I'll temporarily like suspend how I'm feeling to like understand what the other person is going through. And, and like, I don't know, like I relate to that, Anna. And so Matt? Um, yeah, I relate, I relate to some of what, what I've heard, um, but not all of it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of NI heavy. Um, and so I, I have a really good filter for when someone's needs are genuine and when they're manipulative or, or a little off kilter. So, um, I've, I've, you know, I'm probably a little older than you guys too. So I've gotten over the years gotten really good at kind of not only understanding whether or not I even have energy to, to focus towards someone else's needs, but whether it's, it's even something I should bother with. Um, and so I'm very selective um, because there's a lot of people who I could probably help on a daily basis. Um, and, um, and I just have to be really careful with, with my energy, um, especially since my family and work just really take up so much of it. There's not much left at the end of the day. Um, 
But yeah, that's that's kind of summarizes it for me. I just wanted to jump in real quick. This is off topic anyway, but I think it's so cool watching everyone's NI eyes while you guys are talking. Your eyes are like doing the NI shift. It's so cool. <laughs> well, yeah. I, um, Matt, I just wanted to say one last thing. One thing um, for the, uh, probably all the types have to learn this in their way, but twos especially, we have to learn to prioritize because the tendency to is to go out to where where the validation is going to be which tends to be not where your responsibilities lie like in your home with your family members because after a while they just you know, you know especially when the you have the little kids there's not a whole lot of validation coming back to you so the temptation is to go outside to where the validation is and to pour your energy there and that's been something that i've been having to learn is to focus here and really wean myself off. I've, for, uh, I've gone through the process for about a decade now of weaning myself off of that need for validation because I'm, it, it doesn't align with my, where my priorities need to be, where my energy needs to go. And so I had to um, go through the process of starving it essentially. And it sounds like that's similar to what you're saying. You're just having to have your, your priorities lined up correctly. I love that you're doing that, by the way, Karen. Like, that's very honest. It's very good. Yeah. Thank you. With FE, like, when we don't get the validation, is it possible, like, we negatively infer into that? Like, maybe it's something wrong with us, or maybe we need to try harder, or maybe, um, yeah, food for thought. And so, Jesse, how is it like being a three? Want to tell us your three quirks? <laughs> Yeah, I've got some notes. So I'm going to be looking at my phone where I was taking them. Um, so what I tried to do was I tried to look at reasons why I would be taking on these traits as a three because I was looking and threes are really uncommon for INFJs um, for whatever reason that may be. Um, one of the things that I thought was funny about uh, type three is they're supposed to have a lot of confidence and INFJs are not known for that. And I personally am not a super confident human. But what I think I have a lot of confidence in is my ideas. So it's like my ideas are solid. So if I'm trying to um, like push some of my thoughts out into the universe, I have a lot of confidence in those, that I'm doing it right. And that I really don't care if somebody criticizes it because I believe really strongly in, in my thought process. But I'm not going to ever be somebody who just like walks into a room and like owns that room. Like that's not, not what I do. So I thought that was interesting. Um, it's kind of a quirk I don't have with the three when I was looking. Um, so I was trying to figure out like, well, how could I, how is this part of me? Um, but it's definitely my ideas. And that might be because I'm an NITI dominant. So I'm like jumping between the two things. And I just, I'm incredibly analytical and spend a lot of time thinking. That's like my favorite thing to do. Same. So I've got a lot of confidence there. And so what quirks do you relate to? So some of the things that I think that um, I do more so than other INFJs that I know is that I am really focused on putting things out. So like my work output and I have a lot of energy like I have and I'm also super braggy, as you can tell. That's a thing with threes, right? We're bragging about our accomplishments all of the time. So um, I've slept in five times in the past two years. And three of those is when I have the flu. And I, when I say sleep in, I mean past 5.30. I get up and I run. I'm constantly running. I'm constantly writing. I read 108 books last year. You guys, my project is thousands of people. Like, I'm obsessed with getting things done. Like, I have to. Or I can't, like, I sleep five hours a night at max. Like, I just, I get so much done. <laughs> my energy is ridiculous. And I, I don't know many people who can compete. I would die. Yes, I hear that all the time. But it's like I can't help be any other way. Like this is just the way I'm wired because I have to. Because part of the thing about being an INFJ is we all secretly hate ourselves, right? <laughs> like, and so if I don't do this, I'm worthless. And that's a huge three thing. And it's a huge INFJ thing. If I don't do these things then I mean nothing, that I might as well not exist. And that's a really big, um, it's a struggle. It's a struggle for threes, but I bet you it's a struggle for most of you also. Am I right? 
So I relate to that a lot. And I feel like what all that you said is something that I strive for. But I think as Enneagram One, I also strive for improving myself in other areas. So it's like, now it's like, well, how do I get better at resting and doing that, which is so, I feel so silly and such an Enneagram one thing to like, let's analyze how to play and rest better. And, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very funny because when I first met Anna, I almost thought that was TE. And then I, I thought like, well, I wonder if she's an INTJ um, because I think that could be mistaken for TE sometimes. And, uh, but Anna's obviously not an INTJ, but, uh, it's interesting that Jesse, that's one of your main things. And it's that motivation behind it. So I'm a three, but I am an INFJ and it's because my FE needs that validation. Like I need people to say good job. Like I need those high fives because, and it's really frustrating for me to like exist and to do all these things and to have to outsource my self-worth has been, I'm almost 30 and it's been a huge struggle to need to to outsource my credibility as a human or my my like justification for existing i guess and Gross. i know other infjs relate as well to that it's just that because i'm also a three it's just like extra the need for validation is just huge i relate to you in the sense of like outsourcing validation i <laughs> i told my infp friend i was planning to do 10,000 hours of interviews um, and post them online. And he, my INFP friend was like, why are you doing this? Examine your motives, examine your FI Joyce, look within, <laughs> why are you doing all of this? And it's like, I need to, I just need to. Cause it's like, it's kind of like my vision is kind of set on wanting to, to do that. Cause, and if I don't have my vision, I'm not worth it. Like if I don't follow through with my vision, like then, then what is my vision and worth if I don't? So it's kind of like I'm putting something on the line that no one else can see and I need to meet that or I feel worthless. Yeah, it's that SE inferior too, to an extent, the way that that NI and SE work together. So it's like you have this great vision. And then for me, like I've always been very, um, I think this might be a three thing too, because threes are very image conscious and they're very, um, they're focused on how they're perceived. And so I feel my SE inferior strongly. And so like, it's like, I have this vision, but if I don't bring it out into reality, then who cares? And I know that for other INFJs, they're in for INTJs as well, other NI dominants, they're okay playing with one idea in their head forever. And I'm really, really not. Um, I, I'm really not okay with it just existing in my head. It has to be out in the world or there's no point. And it's, uh, it's not a great thing, but it, it is what it is at this point. I can use a little bit more of that. I'm like so fine with things only existing in my mind. I've gotten upset with the world before because you have to actually do things. And I'm like, but why? It already exists inside of my head. Like that's all it needs to be. So I, yeah, give me some of that, please. <laughs> you don't want it. <laughs> you don't want it. I'm very tired all the time. And then I get the call, the, the martyr thing, or I get called, I'm doing it for attention. And to an extent, that's accurate, like, because I care about what, how I'm being perceived, right? But I, it's, it is my wiring. It is the way it is. I'm 98% agreeing completely with uh, Lizzie on what she said about, like, it can live in my head. I don't care. If it's something that I actually need to do, I'm out and on it. But otherwise, whatever. You're an orphan, <laughs> Chafer Miller. <laughs> Something like that. Um, and then the last thing I was going to say about the three is that um, they have the faces. And that's something that INFJs are often accused of, like the memes that I see with the INFJ, like refuge and stuff like that on Facebook. It's that like they have a different personality for all the people. I mentioned this earlier that they go around. Um, and that's something that threes, particularly three wing two, which is what I am, are known for. is like being able to adapt to situations. Um, and I feel like almost all of you can probably relate to that, to like changing your face, depending on who you're with. Am I right? I have a time limit on that. It runs out after a while. It does for me too, actually. If, it, if that person no longer is 
serving a purpose. That doesn't, that sounds really bad, but it's not, I don't mean it that way. I just mean like if that person is, has gone past the point to where I feel like I can do what they need me to do, I kind of revert back to, I guess, some sort of default. Is that what you mean, Keelan? So I, like, I do relate to the, um, like wanting to accomplish big things kind of thing. And I'm like, sit, a lot of times I'm just like sitting here thinking like, no, you weren't like put on this earth to not do anything important. Like you're gotta do something, but there's, I don't know, this might just be like a head triad fear, or I don't know if anyone else would relate to this, but there's also like a huge like fear that I have that's like combating that say, like feeling like I'm not qualified to be like leading like super important things. And I'm like scared to be in charge of like something that's like, that I would consider like an important accomplishment because I'm scared that of, of like screwing people over or like doing something before I'm ready. So I'll like, I feel like I withdraw a lot more, but I really have that like desire to just do everything and like, but I'm also scared. I have that weird quirk where like, and I've seen this meme all over INFJ things too, but it's like, I hate, I hate myself, but I also think I'm the best person for the job. So it's like, I feel like this, like, I hate myself. I'm worthless, but like, I can probably do this better than anybody else. So I should probably just do it. Yes. I think I'm like literally the exact opposite of that. I'm like, I'm kind of okay with myself, but I know I'm not qualified to do this. Like somebody else will do it better than me. That's just like always what, what I'm thinking, especially cause like, I know I'm a seven and I'm like, I don't really go like in as in depth as other people would when things would. Yeah. Fascinating. And so type fours. So Matt, what are your INFJ four quirks? I had to put my glasses on because like Jesse, I took some notes that I need to look at because my memory is really bad. I, I can't remember anything um, at work. My STJ boss is the opposite. He's he has a photographic memory, so we understand each other in that regard. Um, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, you know, one, one of the quirks is just withdrawing, um, withdrawing from from all the chaos and when my energy runs down, I need to withdraw and contemplate and do uh, re self discovery. Um, and it, it's something that has to happen over and over, um, especially especially with regard to, to writing. Um, if I'm too right, then I have to I have to clear my mind and I have to be able to access a place um, really uh, deep in my intuition. Um, so I think that's kind of quirky. I think my family thinks it's really quirky, um, but they're very, very gracious in that. Um, but um, also, you know, there's the, um, I guess, uh, speaking to quirks as far as the, the vices go, um, is, you know, sometimes going to lengths to differentiate myself uh, in unusual ways. Um, like maybe I just take this completely out of the box viewpoint on something that's totally different than everyone around me. And I really believe it, but I'm, I'm very uh, vocal about it, you know, so they understand that, Hey, I don't believe the same thing you believe um, because I'm looking at it from this other perspective over here. And that starts getting into some INFJ stuff too, I think. Um, and even into like how I dress sometimes, like from an INFJ standpoint, I'm, probably looking more to accentuate my body, you know, when I dress, but then this Enneagram four quirkiness thing is uh, to be individualistic and to try to dress like I dress for me, like I, I'm not trendy. Uh, I want to look good in my own eyes and I want it to be my own unique style. Um, so that's what I do, you know, um, you know, and I've worn stuff before and people make comments like, well, why are you wearing that's That's strange. Why are you wearing that? Like, cause you know, I'm the only one that's wearing this and that's why I'm wearing it. Um, <laughs> but uh, you almost get a high from it sometimes, you know, like when someone acknowledges that, Hey, yeah, you're, you're kind of a, you're kind of a weird cat. You're kind of a strange dude. Um, like I, that's a compliment to me. Like I, I want to hear that. <laughs> um, but yeah. And the, um, you know, as far as the other quirks with uh, like in the, equanimity that I mentioned earlier, something else I do, and this, this came with time, I think, uh, but just being able to sit with my feelings and explore them and not really even understanding them, but just exploring them and trying to get to the bottom of things and, um, and doing that without being swept away. Um, 
there was one quote I saw that said, you know, relating to Enneagram fours, it said, our emotions are the sea. Um, and so, you know, we, when we're doing well, we're at peace emotionally, which is kind of what equanimity gets into. Um, and we can accept that sometimes things are bad and sometimes things are good. Um, you know, and we can find peace in that. And we, and really, um, I would say as an INFJ for, um, we can find more other perspectives in it as well. And so you get into perspective shifting and that sort of thing, which is, you know, which is a totally an INFJ thing. And, um, you know, and then really using intuition to look past the stress of the moment to say, Hey, you know, this, this thing can't hurt me, this negative emotion or whatever it is, it can't hurt me because I know that in a day or two days or three years, whatever, that, um, you know, I'm going to move past this and, and, um, you know, I, I have to be careful because I'll look beyond my entire existence into like, well, I'll be dead someday. So I won't feel this pain anymore. You know, uh, that's probably not always the best way to look at it. But, um, you know, looking looking over the pain, around the pain um, so that it doesn't control you, I think is is a big thing for me um, and being able to, um, you know, just be in pain, but still be able to function, be able to, to, to help others who are in pain at the same time. And, uh, to, just to do all those INFJ things that, that we like to do. So, yeah, that's probably enough. I think that's a, a lot of quirk, a lot of quirkiness for you guys. And so INFJs relate, don't relate. I grew up like, uh, being the weirder one groups, like the King and the Misfits. And then eventually it caught up. One of my friends calls me the the queen of the Island of Misfit Toys. That's really funny. I, I understand that so well. However, it would give me super hardcore anxiety to dress in a way that was not like, I don't think I'm super trendy by any means, but like it would give me, when you were talking, I was getting anxiety, just like trying to picture myself, like having a fashion sense that I consider mine. Um, would give me a lot of anxiety as a three because self-image is important. So it's important that I look like a certain thing. So I mimic. So like I spent a lot of time like watching people on TV shows and figuring out like how to dress like them. And like, I, I could not do that. It gave me like, nope. I felt kind of the same. Like I have four in my tri type and, but I'll wear like unique socks and then dress normal or like unique earrings and dress normal. But I don't know if I could do like a whole outfit. And especially not like as part of me, you know, as like a statement of who I am. Same. I have four on my tri type and the socks are kind of kooky, but it's chinos, a plain shirt, and then just something to break it all up. I find that my um, connection to four comes out in ways like that, where I'll just wear something odd. And uh, it's, it, it's feels good to me because I, I feel like I'm, doing some good identity work in differentiating myself in some way instead of blending in. So, you know, I've collected some various hats, which I don't put on very often, but they're definitely like, no one walks around wearing those hats, at least where I live, um, you know, crazy socks and that sort of thing. Maybe some like boots that are very, like really catch your attention. And, and um, it, it feels, it's one of those awkward things because I know that I'm drawing attention by wearing it. And that feels, I feel self-conscious about that. And yet it, it does feel like some good identity work for me to be doing it at the same time. So I still, I, every once in a while I'll do that, but yeah, I don't, it's not a regular part of my life like you, Matt, to, uh, it sounds like it's a staple for you. Yeah. I, well, something else, I, I grew up in a really heavy SI household. And it was, it was, and it was always, and I, th I think this was SI. It was always like you should do this, you should do this because of this, and like th there was never really any like going outside of the box or anything. And so, um, yeah, I'm I'm certain that 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 had some you know factor in this in this whole thing. Yeah. So with the way that I dress, it's normally like someone told me, "Hey, that looks good on you," and then I'm like really cool then I'll, I'll wear more of that if it looks good on me <laughs> yeah so that's where my sense of style comes from like when i when i get validated by other people and they're like you should wear that it'll it'll look good on you and i'm like sure i'll 
I like to wear things that look good on me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's in, it's interesting in our household because my my wife's an ESFP, um, and so she's she's really I feel like she's pretty trendy uh, in her in her attire. Um, you know, like within within taste, within reason. Um, and so sometimes she'll, you know, suggest something and I'm just like, well, everybody's wearing that. I don't want to wear what everybody else is wearing. And uh, I'm like, does this not look good? You got to tell me that if it looks bad, I'll find some other unique attire to wear. <laughs> but um, And she'll tell me if it looks bad. You know, thankfully, she's very honest with me, but uh, in a very nine sort of way, you know. <laughs> that's cool that's cool and Anna before we move on oh I was gonna say that I relate to that very strongly um especially when I was younger uh like if every like I kind of hate trends like if everybody else likes something that's like oh I, I can't like it now like um but then there's also a little bit of anxiety that comes with that because I still I just I don't want people to judge me or to not be doing the right thing but I just I want to wear what I want to wear it's like I don't understand why other people should tell us what to wear when this is what I like and um but yeah I, I don't know if maybe it was disintegrating before when I was younger but sometimes it even the bad part of this was that sometimes I would do that with people like if everybody liked a person then I didn't want to like them <laughs> I've grown out of that at least, but well, mostly. <laughs> That's really cool. And so any comments before we move on to the next type? All right, so we are on type six and that is me, Joyce, I think. I originally thought I was a one, but then I got typed by a lot of people, like a lot of people. And the common consensus tends to be six. So I'm gonna just roll with that for now. Uh, <laughs> as a type six, I always doubt the fact that I might not be type six. So always doubting my type <laughs> in six fashion. And so the quotes that I don't relate to about the type six is that like the descriptions are very SI heavy, which is why originally when I read them, I was like, this doesn't sound like me. But if I like take out the SI, then it could sound like me. <laughs> Another thing I don't relate to about the type six is that they say like they're fearful and I well I am but I'm not about day-to-day -day things so I know a lot of people in my life who are fearful about like petty or trivial things and although I, I am like I do have fear it's not towards like day-to-day -day petty trivial things that I consider that way and when I see someone fretting over that I immediately question if I'm a type six because uh is that a six thing so anyways th that's my self-doubt <laughs> to start off the type six you know, self-doubt train. And so the parts of the type six that I do relate to is is the analyzing and, and skepticism and doubting just to understand things more. So I tend to like think and think and think um, and beat ideas to death because I wanna understand them more. And so I relate to that quality of the type six. Another quality I relate to the type six is noticing red flags. So I am very, like when I see a red flag, I notice that it is a red flag or a possible red flag. So my warning bells can go off really easily, but um, it's normally about like the most likely scenario. And sometimes the most likely scenario is kind of dark. And so something I relate to is being called a little pessimistic or realistic by other people because I can see like the red flags. And when I tell people, it can sound like I'm being pessimistic, but I'm not, it's like realistic. It's just that everyone is a little pseudo optimist. I mean, a little too optimistic about it. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's like, I notice red flags really easily. Um, so that's a part of this type six that I relate to. Um, another part of the type six I relate to is the planning. So I, I do like, I, I do, like, so what sixes are known for is that like in, in their in their past or when they were growing up, they didn't have basic trust with parental figures or authority figures because they felt like they were undependable or untrustable. Um, and I relate to that because I, you know, when I grew up, I felt like adults weren't really being adults. So I felt like I had to grow up a little fast <laughs> and like, um, you know, plan or like, so in case like things 
didn't go the right way, like I could make sure that they didn't go to complete like bottom. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, and another part of type six that I relate to is my, um, like, so they say sixes are fight, flight, or friends. And I, I do relate to that. Like, okay, so something about me, I don't know if this is PTSD and I'm just not aware of it, but um, it's kind of like, I feel like my brain's always in fight, flight, or, or friends. Um, so, so it's instead of fight, fight, or freeze, they say fight, fight, or friends because sixes, they place a lot on friendship and finding security in friendship. I, I relate to finding safety in friends, I think, but doesn't everyone. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I'm sure there are more reasons, but I'm currently blanking out. I, I think the reason why people type me as six is because in my voice, there's like a natural apprehension to it. And I think it's, I'm not sure if it's because I'm shy or if I'm just like nervous all the time because my fight or flight instinct is always on. But I, I don't know if that's an Enneagram thing or if that's a <laughs> um, need, to, need to see someone <laughs> or anything. Yeah, who knows? Um, but yeah, those are the reasons I'm a six. I just... I just like to, to plan. <laughs> and so INFJs, do you relate, not relate? Your thoughts? I like, I have a six wing and I feel like I just relate to every single thing that you've said so far. But I think like, so the thing that you said about like wanting to be prepared for everything in case everything like goes wrong and like knowing you need to trust yourself because you can't rely on like anyone else to do that. I think that didn't kick in for me until like I got a little bit older because I think when I was younger, I was like, oh, everything will be fine. Everything, everyone else has everything taken care of. But then later I started to realize like, okay, no, like I need to like be, be prepared for like what could ever happen. But yeah, everything else, I just did all of it. <laughs> it relates so hard, especially like the constantly being in like uh, fight or flight mode. But I don't think I seek like security and friendships, I think I just try to find it like by doing everything myself. So, but all of it, yeah. Yeah, I, I relate. I relate to it a lot too, Joyce. I've got six in my tri type, and um, as well as one, four, six, and one. So, yes, and and the part about uh, not trusting adults as a child that like that hit pretty hard because uh, yeah, I felt that really strongly. When I was uh, when I was younger, is uh, I had a couple bad experiences with adults um, who were more like children, and so that um, kind of stuck with me for a while, I guess. I also relate. Um, my parents had me when they were super young, so I understand being the feeling like the adults around me were not adults. I've changed my understanding on that as I've gotten older, but I do understand like growing up too quickly. I've heard a lot of people say that that's one of the things that makes you an NI dominant. Like those people who believe that it's because of your circumstances. It's because if you grew up in a hostile environment or a maybe not, not super great one, you tend to have to plan ahead for the future. So like NI has to kick in. So you end up relying on it and that's how you become an NI dominant. I don't know that I agree with that necessarily, but I've heard it said. Um, I related to you in that way for sure. And also the planning. Um, and I like to yeah. have contingencies for the contingencies. So I'll have like 15 things that I'm going to do. And like, if this goes wrong, I have a backup and it's been really important to me. I've gotten better about it as I've gotten older though, cause I've gotten to trust myself more, but especially when I was younger. Um, one of the things that I didn't necessarily relate to was the fight or flight. Um, I have a lot of anxiety, but it's usually when I'm by myself. Like when I'm in a situation, I kind of feel like I, I dominate the situation. Um, but it's probably a three thing. Like I like to like, when I get into a place, I'm just like, and not dominant as in do well, but like I, I kind of just take charge and do what needs done. Um, I kind of like chaos and like, the, I like the bad, the crazy things, I guess, to an extent. Yeah, I relate to the contingencies on contingencies on contingency plans. Yeah. <laughs> I feel inherently awkward about like sharing about me. And so like, I don't know how to talk about myself, but uh, <laughs> how, how about you, Karen or Anna or Lizzie and Keelan? Any thoughts? And yeah. So my 
instinctual subtype as a self-preservation one, I think is named worry. <laughs> so I relate to some parts of that, but it just has a little bit of a different flavor or a little bit of a different motivations of, um, yeah, of, of always planning ahead. And it's, it's so, I mean, <laughs> For those in the audience who didn't know this, I was asking questions in the chat. I was like, what are we going to talk about? How are we, what video system are we going to use? Because I just wanted to be prepared so that I could do things well. And yeah, so I think more of my fear. I mean, sometimes I think I can be a bit controlling in wanting to help other people do things right. But most of it is more of like, I want to make sure that I'm doing things right as far as my part. Yeah, I I do relate to a lot of that. Um, I type myself with a tri-type of, of 296. So I have that. And um, the, right, the contingent, contingencies, I, I'm a bit overbearing with, especially with my kids, trying to, um, I mean, they're still young, but I'm like, I'm wanting them to think that way. It, the, the kind of conversations we're having with, you know, let's say my seventh grader is I'm saying, you know, you had that assignment due and you're you, it's due on this day and you are expecting that you're going to be able to do it, pull it off the day before. But, uh, you know, it's important to plan for things going wrong. And so how can you what can you do now so that when chaos comes, because it always will you can still follow through and get it done when you need to. And I, I tend to be just a, a bit much with, I mean, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a bit of an obsession for me because mainly, and what it is, it's me trying to protect myself because I don't want to deal with the chaos that comes when he hasn't gotten his stuff done. <laughs> so and like the tension that comes with me having feeling like I failed him as a parent or whatever. And so I'm like being overbearing on the front end with, with that. And it's, uh, it is something I really need to, it's, it's, it's too much. And I, I need to back off and give them space to make their own mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. When you have six in your tri-type and you're also a mom. The, the oh my God. Life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, kids. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so, it's so funny, Karen, because I, I, uh, I'm a planner too. I like to plan, uh, just because, yeah, I don't, I don't like surprise. I don't like sudden things, you know, it's, it's so funny though, to watch my, my SE Dom wife try to give these lectures to my SE Dom son about you need to, why haven't you planned? And I'm over here like, well, you, you don't plan anything. <laughs> You're like, what? How can you talk to him like that? I don't say anything. I'm not going to say anything, but um, it's just so funny to watch, you know, I'm over in the corner with uh, leaning against the wall with my arms crossed, just like, mm, this is so, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So another feature of six that I forgot to mention is that although I don't relate to having fear about like petty trivial day-to-day -day things, um, I, I relate to having fear about like the direction of humanity or like the direction, the trajectory of where things are going and like the, the end state of things. So in a, it's in like this vague esoteric way. So those are the types of things that I have fear about. <laughs> and that's where I think my sixness is, is at. And so Emily type sevens, would you like to tell us your se type seven quirks? Yeah. Um, so there was this meme that I saw earlier that it technically was about INTPs, but it was just so perfectly fitting for me. It was like, you know, you're an INTP when you have like 75 tabs open on your computer and you're watching a YouTube video and then you have a Wikipedia article that's like just in case the YouTube video gets boring and then you're also like doing something at your desk, like just doing 9 million things at once, basically keeping your mind occupied. But that's pretty much how I am like all the time. I can't like just do one thing at a time. I can't be like thinking about only one thing at a time. I just, my, I feel like my brain is just always full of clutter. And if I am doing one thing at a time, I'm like coming up with like, okay, well, what am I gonna do after this when I'm done? Like what's next, what comes after that? Like that just never stops. I don't know if that feels like such an NP thing. I, I'm really wondering how many other ITJs relate to that. But. 
So INFJs relate, don't relate. Thoughts? Mm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I kind of relate, but I don't. Like ultimately, I feel like I will think about like one thing at a time, if that. And I feel like I do the opposite. Like rather than think about like what I'm gonna do and then the next thing I'm gonna do, it's like. I don't know. Maybe I'll focus on the one thing I'm doing if if we're lucky. I'll focus yeah, on the I'm... one thing. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm very, very <laughs> focused on getting the the one thing done. Um, I think there's a, a phrase that I heard somewhere, who knows where, somebody in the comments can tell me where this is from, but it's like I'm single minded to the point of recklessness. Um to this that is all I do it's just like this one thing for ever for long periods of time yeah for for me I'm a six wing five so I'm more of a like a, a one one thing at a time too mm -hmm. I'll do the one thing at a time but everything surrounding it like I'll try to think of that too because I'm like I forget who said it, Matt and somebody else. Like, I do not like surprises. If this happens, I want to plan for that and like down the line. But ultimately, it's one or two things at a time. So I think I have ADHD. So that might be why I'm like this. But I will have a lot of different things come up in my mind. But I try to like compensate for that by I will then like write everything down and um you know, I'll think through all the future things of like, oh, what if this happens and this happens and this happens? But I just, I try to get, I want to focus. And so I always come back to trying to focus on one thing at a time because that's where I excel. So that's a good point um, that like, it's like we, it's like what we want to have happen. But like when I mentioned earlier, like how somebody walks in and like, like gets uprooted, I have two small children. So like it makes it hard to focus all the time because they want my attention and like with typecast like uh, my channel my project like if if I'm doing that project like I really do not want to be interrupted but it's so easy and so the, in that aspect like if my kids are coming in I can I can kind of picture like the multiple tabs being open at that point in time because I've got to do my FE and my NI are like fighting real bad um so in that instance then yes I can relate so that was a good a good explanation, Anna. I guess I could explain like a little bit further because like I am focused on like I didn't re even realize this until you guys said all that I am focused on like primarily one thing at all times and I'm like trying to get through doing that one thing. But I think just for the sake of comfort, I just need something going on in the background just in case I lose interest, but I'm not necessarily paying attention to all the other things. I just have them there. But yeah, I prefer to focus on one thing. And I like, I don't relate to the whole seven stereotype of like not being able to like to pursue anything in depth or learn anything in depth because I think I can, but I just like overcrowding my brain with stimulation. That's super cool. And so any thoughts before we get into type eight? I'm trying to figure out if this, um, if I do relate to you, Emily, more so or not. It's a little tough. What, what I will say is my preference is always to focus on one thing at a time. But like you're saying, Jesse, when you have kids or there's some sort of job that has people accessing you just at random times, that's that can be very frustrating. It is for me. I imagine you all may relate to that, um, just that interruption. And so uh, I find that I, when I know, when I anticipate that an inter interruption may come, I don't want to get into the production side, something that is on the production side. So I will go to the consumption side and then I'll, inter you know, I don't, cause I'm not as attached to that. That's not like my ego is not attached to the consumption side. So I will have that several different things of media going on and whatnot. Cause I, I don't, if I'm interrupted in the middle of that, that doesn't bother me too much. But if I'm in the middle of, interrupted in the middle of trying to produce something that really bothers me um, because it just, just throws me off the trail. And so um, I don't, I actually don't try to do too much that's productive because I know that I actually will get very angry if I'm interrupted and I like to take it out on the people 
around me. And so I just, I don't, you know, th- this is why in my, in my point in life, I just don't do too much. Like I don't produce very much. <laughs> so I don't know if that's, if that's any, what you're describing, Emily, but I do relate slightly to what you're saying. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. I think I'm like, I'm constantly anticipating interruptions because I feel like I can't really control whether someone's going to interrupt me or not. So I might as well like be prepared for it to happen. But I, if like my ideal situation, which just doesn't happen very often, it would be to like just be alone for like a whole day and be able to do like just go deep into whatever it is that I have to do. I would love like multiple days of that, but like that's not <laughs> always like accessible for me. But yes, I really like all of what you said, just exactly how I feel. So cool. And so Keelan, would you like to tell us a little bit about your experience as a type eight? Are we doing uh, quirks or uh, quirks and perks? All, all your perks and quirks. <laughs> okay. Quirks. I absolutely hate being controlled, like lied to, manipulated, anything just like sets me off completely. And I think because of like the, uh, the N-I-F-E, T-I, like if it even feels like that, it's like, okay, now we're having a conversation then. This is not going to happen. And then the wing nine like i think and also fe like i think i um project that onto other people so i don't like being controlled but if somebody else is like being bullied or controlled it's like oh you're not going to control them either like this is my pack right here what are you doing um i think i don't know if that's necessarily a negative thing like it looks brash like i know i'm a little rough around the edges and that's kind of one of the uh one of the uh quirks too taking criticism is another thing like I don't mind if I'm messing up like I don't mind at all but if somebody that I don't really respect tells me that it's like man get out of here what are you talking about um and often I think I might look more brash um than I really am but I feel like I probably do look like a jerk like a lot like that's one of the fe like um one of the things I'm harsh on myself about like after a full conversation with somebody that if it's like not going favorable, I leave like, oh damn, like I think I was maybe being too harsh on that person. It's actually ruined relationships for me. My ex-wife could not stand me being real with anybody. It was rough. Um, I think that's about it. Like eights are known just to be real brash and like to the point. I'm more laid back like the eight, nine, but again, I'm very Papa Bear about it. It's amazing when you call yourself Papa Bear. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of, it has this protective energy when you call yourself that. It's like you protect people. It's really sweet. Yeah, but it's also soft. It's not like the worst thing. <laughs> yeah, secretly a, a plushy bear inside. <laughs> and so relate, don't relate, thoughts, INFJs? I relate with kind of the... Um... Keelan and I have talked about this before, like that, that need to like being super upfront with someone. Um, but because for me, like I kind of have like that held back part where like, I have to, I have to hold back. I really admire that in him that he can just be like super honest and upfront with people because I want to be, I definitely think those things, but it's hard to, to say those things. And I know for INFJs, that is one of the stereotypes that they deal with is that they're, um, they're brutally honest or they can be kind of critical at times. Um, but I think if you're doing it for somebody's personal growth, that's really admirable. And it's a good thing, especially if you're protecting your people. So I think that's a great trait to have. It would cut out a lot of the time of people beating around the bush. Like, well, I, I don't think it's like, no, you're messing up. Let's do it. Come on. Progress. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my wife's a nine W eight, nine wing eight. And um, the whole thing you you said, Keelan, about um, not liking people to try to control you and stuff like that. Like she's I've seen her react to that before. And um, yeah, she doesn't she doesn't like that either. So um, but yeah, I I mean, I relate to that, too. I don't I don't like to be for people to try to control me. I had had people try to control me when I was young. And um, yeah, just uh, never really set well and still doesn't so okay um so you guys said that you don't like being controlled um i don't like being controlled either but i'm really good at faking it so like if somebody's trying to control me like i'm good at pretending to do what they want me to do but then i really just go do whatever 
So for you two who are saying like you don't like being controlled, I think I know Keelan's answer maybe, but like how would you guys, what would you do if somebody was trying to control you? Like what would be your reaction? Because for me, I just fake it and then go off and do whatever. I get this big smile that creeps across my face like a smirk. My eyes get low. It's like, show me your credentials, madam. Yeah, I um, I, I, I let them think they're controlling me. <laughs> like, I guess like you're saying, Jesse, um, and I just do what I want to do. <laughs> I was raised by wolves, though. Like, that stuff is not sliding. Like, we're very honest with each other. It's a very demonstrative family. So one thing um, I've... I've talked with you about this before, Joyce. One part of my work and maturity has been to tap into that eight, Keelan, but to do it, you know, that IFJ is known for a door slam. I know that the types are as well, but where I'm bringing the honesty in earlier in the relationship than, than like stuffing my feelings until a point of no return to where I'm just kind of like done. And, um, and so that's that's where uh, I see it at least as well. I see it as reaching for both the eight and and the four at the same time. But it's it's having that um, the bluntness, but trying to deliver in in a kind way. So maybe it's not actually blunt, but the honesty delivered, hopefully in a kind way. But early in the relationship, enough to where the relationship can be salvaged. We can adjust. We can work together. We can find find something, um, a common ground that works between us um, instead of uh, having the, um, maybe the silent blow up and then just it's closed. So. My ex-wife is also a two. Like she didn't like to be blunt with anybody, but that's just because she didn't want anybody to not like her at all. But that breaks me to see people like that. Tell them how you feel. Like, what are they going to do? leave then they should be gone anyway you know i like how the eights like chest out be honest <laughs> yeah face it head on <laughs> that's lovely any other thoughts before we move on to nine also it probably helps that i'm a six foot brown guy so i'm not really afraid of anything like i can get away with more stuff probably yeah as, as someone who is um uh, far too often, I don't speak my mind on things. Um, yeah, I, I think that's an admirable trait to like be able to like get it out there and do it. You know, like for me, like I get major anxiety over it. You know, sometimes I can do it. Other times I just get so much anxiety, um, like I will get physically ill. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a good that's the best way to be like get it out there. Get the conversation started. If the if the person doesn't respond, it's on them. You've done your part. So yeah, I'm, I'm I, I like that Keelan is like that. So that's good stuff. This what you see right now is incredibly turned down. He has ten more levels of eight. <laughs> He's holding it back for us. <laughs> now I wonder what the raw, unfiltered you is. <laughs> You would only see it if you said something like way outlandish and I don't know, like putting somebody else down or saying something racist, like you wouldn't get it otherwise. Like it doesn't have to be even specific, just something incredibly ignorant. It's just, what did you say? And then it starts that conversation. Quick, someone say something ignorant. <laughs> Pineapples on pizzas are great. Agree. Pizzas are terrible. <laughs> the anchovies. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the next level of eight, or are we not there yet? You're entitled to your opinion. <laughs> well, your really opinion right. might be wrong, Adam. Just trying to push it. <laughs> Great. And and so Elizabeth, would you like to let us know a little bit about your life as a type nine? my life um well as a nine i don't actually know who i am so there's that um half kidding but uh i don't know. i was gonna say earlier um i think one part of being a nine is like when jesse was saying earlier that like 
we secretly hate ourselves and stuff. I was like feeling the opposite. Like I love myself and I have to because as a nine, if I'm uncontent or if I'm like not completely happy at the core of my being, everything would fall apart. Like that's all I've got. So I feel like at least for me being an INFJ nine, like one of my core things is like, I love myself no matter what. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to be anything. I just am content wherever I am. I actually like, I didn't know so I got into like the Myers-Briggs um, or I guess the typology Twitter um, a couple of years back after I was already into it for like 10 years. And then I just kind of stumbled upon it. And um, like three years ago, I think I saw Susan Storm posted something and she was like, okay guys, don't get into typology, but just kind of explain who you are. Like what is your core um, or like what drives you, whatever. And I was like, oh, you know, like, I'm just content wherever I am, like, that is my biggest drive, is to just be, like, exactly, like, perfectly content, no matter what's going on, who I'm with, like, whatever, and um, someone was like, okay, I know we're not talking type, but this is such an Enneagram 9 mood, and I was like, oh, is it, like, what is that, I didn't know, and then I looked it up, and I was like, oh, shoot, like, that's the definition, basically, so I feel like I really fit the stereotypes there, um, Stereotypes I don't fit. I feel like a lot of the stereotypes and quirks I don't fit into are because I'm SX dominant and that's somewhat unusual for nines. And so like, I have a lot more intensity and I'm much more outspoken than most nines I've met. Um, like if I disagree with something or if I don't like somebody in a group or whatever, I'm not scared to show that. Um, that being said, I am terrified of conflict. So sometimes those conflict a little bit. But I think like if I don't like somebody or if I don't like what something stands for or what I'm being told to do or something like that, then it's a lot easier for me to embrace conflict and to be like, okay, it's worthwhile because because I already don't care. But if it's something I care about or someone I care about and there's conflict, it's like the scariest thing in the world to me. That is mind blowing, Elizabeth. So with me, I don't know who I am, but it might be for different reasons. So in a sense, like I, I can give a statement of who I am, but then I'll, I can I can go like, well, it could also be like, I can rationalize it this way, but if I look at it this way, I can also see it this way. So ultimately, how do I know which one is, is me? And so then I just don't really come to a clue. I don't really come to a conclusion to, as to who I am. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. Like with my sixth out, it's like I can TI look at all the the holes in the logic. And so I end up not really with not really with a statement of who I am. Mm -hmm. But um because I can combat it. As the type nine takes things towards contentment, I take things towards discontentment. So my my I, my gravitation is to to take something and then take it to a more like a dark place not not dark but it's almost like i can i'm aware of the realities that people tend to overlook and mm -hmm. it and it kind of it's kind of like it doesn't cause contentment in me it causes restlessness yeah if, if that's the best way i can put it <laughs> i think i understand that i wonder that seems like a hard thing to come up with an example for but if you have any examples i think that'd be an interesting thing to analyze I see a married couple and I know them well or something, but I know that they have certain issues in their relationship or something. I know from their dynamic that like from the micro cues that it might not work out or something. This is a bad example. I'm just trying to come up with one in the spot. So it's like this predictive capability of knowing how it's going to go, but I want to be proven otherwise. Like I want it to be the better result, but then sometimes more often than not, it's like proven that it, that probably is the case. And it's kind of like causes like a restlessness because I notice it and no one else really talks about it. And I notice that. Yeah. That's really interesting. I've said before that six is have like a sixth sense. Like they can tell when like by people's energies or like even people with wing sixes oftentimes can tell like if something's wrong with somebody or if something's gonna happen to somebody and they like, I don't know, like they're super in tune with their own anxieties and with things that could go wrong. And oftentimes they're super right about things like that. 
That's interesting. You could be an Enneagram teacher, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> that was so well put. I'm so, so impressed. <laughs> so <clears throat> you both mentioned the fear of conflict. Um, and like, so for, I'm interested in, cause I have that too, I don't like conflict, but I'm interested in your reasoning behind it. Um, because for me, it's because it's an inconvenience usually. Because if there's a conflict, then I have to fix it. And then I can't do what I want to do and I can't get things done. And that makes me resentful and upset. But I'm curious about why you guys, and like, that's just me being super honest. Like, so we, like, I just hate it. But I'm curious why you each and anybody else, like, if you don't like conflict, what is your reasoning? I dig peace. Peace is always like the, um, is always the, uh, the goal. But if you have to destroy 25% of that room to get that piece every time, like I'm a pot stirrer though, it doesn't. Oh, and as far as like the not knowing myself thing, I can't articulate my emotions very well. I've noticed that. Me neither, man. Those things suck. Why do we even have them? They're just not, what are they good for? I feel like for me with conflict, um, it's like, I, yeah, I like what you said, Keelan. I dig peace. Like, if someone is uncontent, and especially if I'm part of the reason why they're not content, it's terrifying to me. I don't know. I don't even know why exactly, but, like, just the idea that I would need to change or something would need to change for someone else to be at peace, it's like, it goes against my values. I'm like, you should already be at peace. I've done everything I can possibly do to make you be at peace and to make a relationship at peace. Like, I am just a conductor of peace. And so if someone that I know or that's around me or even that I don't know is around me is is upset or, yeah, usually upset is the one that gets me. It's like, okay, we have to fix this really soon because otherwise who knows what's going to happen. I don't know. I, I didn't work that well. It's like a core thing and I don't even know where it comes from really. Well, it's that – it's one thing that you can change if you feel like it's on you, like you can change that. I was going to say, I think like my fear of conflict is actually like completely opposite of what you just said, Lizzie, because I think like in a way I can like handle like sort of the emotional ex escalation and I feel equipped to like bring it back to a level where like it can be peaceful again. And also I feel like equipped to improve the situation that like if I know what the problem is and like make it better like I think the only reason I would be afraid of conflict because I think I'm usually not honestly but like my fear is like just not being able to articulate the TI of why I see a problem or why it is and then I'm scared that the person is just gonna like dismiss me and be like oh you're stupid like this is an easy solution and then I won't have like a response to that like basically I'm just afraid of like saying I'm concerned about something and then it just not being taken seriously at all or someone telling me I'm wrong and not knowing how to back myself up but I'm not afraid of like conflict like normally I trust that like if I have a good well if I have a person that's even worth starting a conflict with then we probably have a strong relationship that we can get through it but I'm like worried about solving the problem I think and not being able to yeah I relate, Keelan, to when you said you were oblivious to your emotions. Yeah, same. <laughs> and so my reason for being conflict averse is that, like, it doesn't lead to, like, good social outcomes. And, like, <laughs> so if it's productive conflict, like, I'll, I'll be okay with it. But, like, when normally conflict is is easily avoidable, so I kind of see conflict as unnecessary in most parts, like... And so if it's possible to avoid it or if it's if it needs to be talked through, then sure. But sometimes if it's just like pure hormones and someone's going to get hurt, you know, you know, you're, you're firing s swords at each other or spears. And then so I'd rather just leave with less casualties. So it, it's a, I guess like it's the six like I don't want to cause unnessary negative outcomes because I can see how it would go. Um, so it's more outcome and ramification based because six is in their sixth sense. <laughs> I want to clarify something too. When I was talking about um, like, if you feel like it's something that 
you did for there not to be peace. It's like, and it's that anxiety, but I'm not saying it's something that you have to change. If somebody doesn't like you for a reason, but it does, it's not a hurtful reason, there's no reason to change that. So I hope I said that right the first time. Totally. I think I got that. I agree. Yeah. I've been in those situations before where someone's like, if you change this thing, then I'll be happier. And I'm like, I'm not going to change that thing because I've already changed this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing for you to be happier. And now you're choosing one more thing and it's just going to be an ongoing list. So like, I'm good. This is me. Take it or leave it. That's fine. I changed the thing. I'm so (laughs) bad about changing the thing, no matter how many times I've already changed it because I don't have that, um, that authenticity thing. Right. Like that's not a thing for me. So like, I mean, maybe it is, maybe one day I'll come to terms with it. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, I've definitely been in, I mean, I've been engaged three times and married to number four. So like, I'm really good at pretending is what I usually say. Anyone else? Anna, what are your thoughts? I've been learning more and more how to choose my battles because as an Enneagram one, I can always see things that we can fix and that I can fix and Um, but you don't always have to bring things up, but then I have like this counter thing of like, as an INFJ, it's like, I don't, I don't want to bring up conflict, but then I, I recognize that in order for us to grow in this relationship, you have to sometimes bring certain things up. And I think that kind of one drive helps me to bring things up a bit more, um, but I'll still feel super anxious while I do it. (laughs) And I'll be overanalyzing it the whole time of like, oh no, am I doing it the right way? Cause like, I know that there's the best, you know, it's not a perfect way, but like, what's the best way that I can present this that's with truth and love. That is wonderful. (laughs) I love how you incorporated a philosophy into it, truth and love. Good principles to stand by. (laughs) And so do you guys have any questions for each other before we close off the panel? I know the least amount about the seven Enneagram. So how do you break that? Like, if you can say it in like layman's terms, how would you describe it? Type seven for dummies. Okay, so like the type seven Enneagram, their like their deepest fear is of being like trapped in like pain. And so the way that they respond to that is like, they kind of, they can be kind of like excessively optimistic in ways that aren't realistic, or sometimes they'll just like, flood themselves with like all these positive experiences and just like looking forward to like shallow like ways to escape their pain and their anxiety but they can also be like you know like creative and um like they're like good at like generating ideas on the fly that kind of thing but ultimately they are trying to escape like their anxiety and they don't always deal with that in the healthiest ways so they can become like very gluttonous very hedonistic like just um just self-indulgent in the worst ways so essentially like, it's about being happy. it's about what um being happy yeah being happy but like i think one of the problems is that they're not like sometimes they're they don't have the discipline we <laughs> we don't have like the discipline to invest in like long-term happiness because we're like just tr- so like desperate to like, get out of that state as quickly as possible I like to think of them as puppies. Like they're super excited about everything and everyone that comes in a room and they're like, oh, it's so exciting. It's so exciting. That's me. <laughs> like a golden retriever. Now I'm curious, Lizzie, what are some interesting facts you have of each Enneagram type? Because like, you know, the six has the six cents, the sevens are the puppies. Uh, okay, well, like, um, for fours, I always think of, I have this friend uh, who's an Enneagram four, he's an ISF, ISFP, um, and he told me once that when he was in grade school, he would get really jealous of people who would come to school with a broken bone, because, you know, they'd have the cast, and everyone would come over and sign the cast, and it's like, oh, that's so unique, you poor thing, like, you know, oh, and I kind of tend to think of them like that in a way, not, you know, not usually to that extent, but it's like, you know, they want to be unique. They want to be accepted and understood for being unique and then never forgotten. You cannot forget an Enneagram 4. Um, for Enneagram 3s, have you guys seen the movie RV? No? No? Okay. Well, basically, it's about this guy who is trying to turn in this proposal, and so he, like, 
tells his family that they're going on a vacation, but it's really a camping trip. So that, and he sneaks out every single night and doesn't sleep to go on his laptop to work on this proposal. And then drives the RV down this super steep cliff to get to this thing on time. And like, you know, he's telling his family this one thing that they're on this vacation. He's telling his work this other thing. And he's really just like super driven in both aspects. Like he wants to be a family man. He wants to be a work man. He wants to, you know, have all of it. But he can't keep it all straight because he's like trying so hard to keep up this image all around. And it's for me as a nine, it's the most stressful thing ever watching him like ride on the front of this RV going down a mountain wearing a suit with his laptop that's like been hidden behind a toilet so he can work on it at 3 a.m. You know, it's just like so. Oh, my gosh. That's how I see threes is like they got to do everything and have the perfect image and they don't sleep. I swear. And I don't know how it's possible. Yeah, I think most of mine revolve around examples of the type from movies and stuff. What do you have for your own? For nines? Um, a cloud rather than a character because we just kind of float along and we're like, oh, I'm just going wherever, just doing whatever. Like, I don't have a personality. I'm a cloud. That's so cute and fluffy. <laughs> Yeah, except that like I, so, and I, I was a cloud. That's so, and cool. I'm a human, so how about one type one? For ones, I usually think of like well, I think of the lady I nanny for usually now, but um like Monica Geller from Friends, you know how she's like this dish goes here and this food goes on this dish and when you're done with this dish you use this type of soap to clean this dish and like we, we could move the things in the apartment but we could also keep them exactly where they are and not move them at all and it's like i love you guys so much i want you to come to my apartment but change nothing <laughs> just keep everything where it is but be here just perfectionistic kind of you're so good at this how about you? I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. I'm sorry. I'm talking so much. Um, for twos, well, my mom's a two. And um, have you guys heard, like, the Enneagram album? The songs? They're so good. I feel like for twos, it's somewhat easy to remember that, or, like, to picture them as just the people who, who give and just keep giving and giving and giving and giving. You have to remind them to, like, do something for them sometimes, or they won't. There's That's true. something else for you. <laughs> Lovely humans. How yeah. about eights? Quite. For eights, like fire, I, I don't know. I think of like the most fiery people ever. Um, I actually like, I worked with an Enneagram eight uh, ENTJ and she was like my mentor in a sales job. And I would always be like, okay, I don't know how to do this thing. And she would say, you just do it. Like you just, you just do the thing. And I'm like, okay, wait, break it down for me. And she's like, okay, here are the steps. You do this and then you do this and then you do this. And I'm like, wait, where's the feeling part? And she's like, nope, you don't feel. I'm like, where's the thinking part? She's like, you don't think, you just do it. <laughs> you just jump in. And I'm like, but I'm scared. And she's like, you don't have time for that. It's not on the steps. You just do it. <laughs> Like, I don't think that, I, that so I hard. work in steps, yeah. <laughs> I'm not telling you, I was, like, I was like, those steps don't involve any of the processes I've been using. I didn't last long in sales, but I always thought she was so cool to just be able to just do things. You're so talented, Lizzie, with this. Okay, so last type, I think, um, five. Could you tell me like a little bit? Oh yes, fives. Um, Okay, uh, have you guys seen the movie Atlantis that's like animated? No? So there's this character who has like kind of crazy hair and he has these giant glasses and he goes on this, on this expedition and the whole time he's got like a satchel and all of these papers and everyone has like, you know, headlamps and they're like digging tunnels and, and exploring things and he's like running around with all of these stacks of paper and they're just flying around. He's like, grabbing them, like tacking them on the wall. And he's like, so if we do this, then it connects to this thing. And then we can do this thing. 
and if you add like this, 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 and this, and then he looks at like the group to check in if they're following and like no one is following his plan, but it like all makes sense inside of his mind. I always picture that, but he's also an INTP. And so it kind of mixes that like extroverted intuition and introverted thinking of he's like got this whole plan inside of his head and he can't do, it's more of like a thought. And doesn't because he like he's like translating from this like ancient book with like this ancient like dead language because he's the only person in the world that's like fluent in that and can read. Yeah, and then he's trying to like communicate it to everyone else, and he can't do that so well, but he can understand it in himself. Or like Albert Einstein, like how his desk was just a mess. Like after he passed away, and they went to his desk, and they're like, "What do we do with this?" Because they just have so many thoughts and ideas, and it's like their brain just kind of explodes when it has to get tangible. Albert Einstein, a cluttered desk, a cluttered mind. And he said, so what does an empty desk mean? Well, I'm not going to show you guys my desk. <laughs> <laughs> Lizzie, thank you for that. That was really interesting. You're welcome. I'm sorry, yeah. I had none of it planned inside my mind. So I'll, yeah. I'm sure as soon as we end this, I'm going to think of like all my better examples. But I feel so enlightened. <laughs> and so any other thoughts before we close the panel? Emily, do you own cats? No, I don't. I, I probably would, but my mom hates them. So <laughs> I've always wanted a cat. I'm a cat person. I have a cat. Of course you have a cat. That's right. <laughs> INFJs are thought of as cat people. I am not a cat person. How are the rest of you cat people? I hate creatures. They are so maybe, disgusting. I do not you like are any animals home. ever. That is the most un-INFJ. <laughs> That's the thing in INFJs I can never relate to. Is they're supposed to like small things. And I do not like small things. None of them. Cats are sociopaths. And I would do only have <laughs> none of them. Know. Jesse, do you like blankets? No. Do you like sweets? Um, I'm, I'm a diabetic, so I eat keto. I haven't had candy or sugar in two years, two and a half years. Do you like lights? I eat like protein and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Um, My house is not very cute. But do you like them? I mean, they're, I don't have, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I, they're okay. They're fine. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a very fun person. <laughs> you guys are lovely. So thank you everyone for coming out on this panel. I really appreciated hearing all of your Enneagram perspectives. Um, and so thank you YouTubers, you know, Jesse, you know, with Typecast Heroes. I really enjoy your videos. Your videos on the cognitive functions are bang on and I love them. And I just love your videos. Like keep on being awesome because you're clearly really well researched in all of your videos and you cite a lot of books and you clearly know what you're talking about. And so, um, yeah, check out Typecast Heroes and also check out Anna Real. She has her YouTube channel too. And if you want to have some type one in your life, you know, telling you the proper way to, to think about your life in psychology and philosophy, there's, there's Anna's channel. And yeah, thank you, Lizzie, for your Enneagram insights. Like you are very powerful with your, the things that you associate with Enneagram types are so like pristine and like really help you picture the Enneagram types better. And you're really chill, but it's like you're humble with how much you know. So like you have this like pleasant energy to you. Like you just feel like a happy person to be around. Like you're content your contentness is contagious and I feel like you make a lot of people happy in your life just because you you don't stress the small stuff you feel like a person who's overall good vibes and really smart about all things type related um so I, I really thought about INFJs man okay so INFJs with type content like they heavily research their stuff like they are so so into their stuff like yeah and with Keelan, like I like how protective and like you are of the people in your inner circle and you're just so chest out with how you live life. You really like are like protective in all the right ways and you know where to like, I don't know, like you don't put up with BS basically. And I appreciate you not putting up with BS. <laughs> I am a dumpster fire. <laughs> you very much, very much are. 
<laughs> but in the best way possible. And so, yeah, Karen, thank you for being like my friend. And like when when I interact with you, I notice all the compliments you give other people. Well, I just want to tell you, like, I want to compliment you every time you talk because you always give such warmth to people. You give people positive encouragement and affirmation. You are words of affirmation in a human being. OK, and I just really appreciate that about you. Karen has the kindest eyes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and Emily, I I like your positivity, you know, and I like your your happy go luckiness and I like your your ability to be that puppy dog like Lizzie said cuz it makes everyone's life brighten up. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's so sweet. I just think I like thanks for like looking out for us. Also bringing like positivity here too with like this all of this and like your outro <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is my first time in being in a room with so many infjs <laughs> yeah it's powerful <laughs> and so matt like thank you for the uniqueness you bring to the world like you always make sure you do things in your own unique way you give the world style you give the world flair so thank you for adding your matt flair to the things that you enter you have really inspiring tweets and so yeah check out all these twitter people you know Lizzie has a Twitter, Matt, Emily, and Anna too. And I do too, but <laughs> like, yeah, it's really entertaining tweets. Thank you everyone for being your INFJ selves. A lot of you people on the panel actually like I've secretly like wanted to be friends with. And so it's nice to have an excuse to gather you guys all in one room. It means a lot to me because I want to be friends with you guys too. And so yeah, check out the YouTube channels, Anna Real and typecast heroes for jesse uh, you won't be disappointed and yeah i hope y'all have a great day a great week great lifetime and i'll see you guys in the next episode bye all <laughs> bye, bye. bye. bye.
Georgia, is she 